some predictions for what to expect in 2018. Plus, you won't want to miss a very special Best of Judge Janine Street Justice. But first, let's go to my first guest, here to react to all of the latest developing stories this week and to tell us what he'd like to see the Trump administration focus on in 2018 is Congressman Lee Zeldin, uh, who's with me now. Hey, Congressman, how are you? It's great to be with you, Lisa. So, Congressman, you uh, had voted against President Trump's uh, tax reform law, uh, his signature law, and, and now you've got your governor who's threatening to sue uh, President Trump over it, particularly in regard to the assault deductions, which is something that you know you were concerned with as well in your opposition to the law. Uh, so do you support Governor Cuomo? Uh, well, no, the governor is, uh, he, he's running for president already. He's trying to get a jump start on 2020. I think that the argument of uh, that it's unconstitutional because it unfairly targets Democrats is uh, ridiculous. Uh, if the governor feels like his job, his work is done at cutting taxes and making it easier for New Yorkers, uh, whether it's our income taxes, our, our sales tax, our property taxes, everything that re the, really the reason why we have the highest uh, state and local taxes in the country, uh, I think that the governor should be focused on that. If, if he thinks that his work is done, then he shouldn't run for reelection in 2018. But it looks like he's already running against the president. And, and no, I, uh, you know, I'm here fighting for my, my district. Uh, I'm fighting for New Yorkers uh, who want to have the best policies come out of Washington for them. Uh, but this governor is certainly way over the top on this one. And, you know, you've been a big supporter of President Trump's. You know, you were even there when a lot of Republicans weren't. So, you know, has this changed the dynamic of the relationship at all, being opposed to the law or being opposed to the tax reform bill? Uh, no, uh, you know, President Trump has had a, a great first year. You look at the numbers on the economic front where the market is, the amount of new jobs that have been created into the millions, uh, unemployment as, at a 17-year low, uh, consumer confidence at a 17-year high on the judiciary front, getting Neil Gorsuch confirmed. On the national security front, I just got back from the Middle East a couple days ago. Uh, it's my third year visiting the troops in uh, Afghanistan. I was in Afghanistan, Kuwait, Jordan on this trip. Uh, I have not seen their confidence as high. Uh, ISIS is getting wiped off the map all across Iraq and Syria. Our military is feeling good about it. It's being very clear for ISIS that uh, any type of caliphate that they want to establish under a Trump presidency is going to be a caliphate in hell. Uh, they're, they're getting wiped out, out of Iraq, but also seeing extraordinary gains uh, in Syria. And on the veteran front, uh, we passed an expansion of the GI Bill that the president signed into law. Uh, the Whistleblower Protection Act uh, for our Department of Veterans Affairs getting passed and signed into law. So I'm just giving a few examples of where I think the president's had a great 2017. Uh, and I stand with him. I support him. Uh, it doesn't mean we're going to agree 100 percent of the time. Right. Uh, but that's what, you know, it, this is about working together on hopefully more wins in 2018. Well, and, you know, Congress, I know you were tweeting uh, throughout the day about the protests we're seeing in Iran. Uh, and you had tweeted that the big difference between what we saw in 2009 when President Obama was criticized uh, for his inaction or for, for, you know, for standing on the sidelines, a lot of people were critical uh, in saying that. And so you said the big difference between that and now is because President Trump, uh, we're seeing leadership. So can you kind of tell us a little bit about, you know, what's going on and what you anticipate or hope to see from the Trump administration in addressing this? Well, the president's leadership right now is critical. We need to learn our lesson from 2009. President Obama missed an opportunity. Millions of Iranians back in 2009 in the Green Revolution uh, protesting the undemocratic election took to the streets. They wanted to overthrow the Iranian regime. President Obama basically said it was none of our business and we weren't involved at all. President Trump understands uh, that these are this, an important lesson learned. Uh, that this is an opportunity making sure that we're not going to be propping up the wrong regime anymore. It's the Iranian regime right now that is calling America the great Satan. They're pledging to wipe us off the map. They test fire in a continental ballistic missiles in violation of U.N. Security Council resolution. It's the world's largest state sponsor of terrorism, uh, financing terror. They have blood on their hands with dead U.S. service members, overthrowing foreign governments. These are just some of the examples. And Iranians are taken to the streets. They're emboldened. And President Trump is sounding off on it. He's, stand, he's realizing that we can't just say this is none of our business. If there was a free, stable, democratic Iran like millions of Iranians want, uh, the Middle East would be better. American national security would be stronger. Uh, our allies would be stronger. Our military would be safer. And the president recognizes that. The president realizes that American exceptionalism is nothing to apologize for. 
American greatness is something for us to be proud of. He's unapologetic about his love for America and understanding that our enemies, they, our, our adversaries don't respect weakness, they only respect strength. We can't be silent, not because we want war, but because we want to prevent it. Well, thank you, Congressman. We appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you, and Happy New Year, Lisa. Thank you. You too. And joining me now, we've got Democratic strategist and Fox News contributor Richard Fowler and Rasmussen Reports political analyst Amy Holmes. Hey, guys. Hey, to be hey. And here. we'll be uh, very cold tomorrow <laughs> in yes, Times indeed. Square, so that's going to be fun. You know, Richard, I want to start with you. Um, we're, we're seeing that Democrats are kind of laying the groundwork to opposing the tax reform bill in 2018, making it sort of a key issue heading into the midterm elections. Uh, but we know that 80 percent of Americans are going to see a tax cut. We're seeing businesses uh, dole out bonuses, making pledges for investments, uh, and some even saying that they're going to increase their own minimum wage to $15 per hour. I mean, is that really something that Democrats want to run against? Uh, I mean, I think we have to wait to see what the benefits of the tax bill are, but I think what you can see right now is that a lot of people in a lot of blue states and purple states are very unhappy with this tax bill. But what about everyone else? I mean, case in point being Fairfax County, Virginia, where their tax office was overrun with people trying to repay their, pay their property tax early so they don't get fined later because of uh, irresponsibility by House Republicans. But Democrats, particularly looking at the Senate, I mean, those guys aren't running in, in a lot of those states. The states that are very competitive for Democrats that they should be worried about are a lot of these red states. No, so, I, I mean, I, I, is I it going to impact people like Joe Manchin for not having voted this when or not voting for this when we're seeing companies uh, already you know pledging investments already giving back bonuses right I, I, I hear that and I think there are some companies that are using their money to invest and I think that's a good thing for the economy but you also have companies who made who gave back bonuses like AT&T which is what the president sort of trumpeted is this great idea but on that same the day before Christmas they also laid off thousands of workers so if they had all this money to spare then instead of giving out bonus maybe they would have kept those workers instead but at the end of the day all these corporations have had money on their books for years. Google, Apple, and Microsoft combined have $463 billion on their books, just sitting in cash. Giving them more cash does not increase our economy. We live in a supply, we live in a demand side economy, not a supply side economy, and it's about time Republicans figure that out. You know, Amy, what do you think? Right now we've looked at polling, and you work in polling. We saw Wall Street Journal, only 17% of Americans know that they're getting a tax cut. Mm -hmm. I mean, how beneficial is this going to be for Republicans? Obviously, they're going to run on this. This is a key, uh, you know, the, the biggest legislative victory Republicans sure. have had last Congress, so, or the, during 2017. So, I mean, what, what do you estimate to happen for Republicans mm -hmm. with this law? And are Democrats going to be successful in their attacks? Well, Lisa, Richard, we saw that press conference of how excited Republicans were to pass the tax bill. And Republican voters, they send Republicans to Washington to cut taxes. It's one of the top issues uh, that, that Republican voters care about. But getting back to the Democratic strategy of resistance, Lisa, I got to ask Mark Penn yesterday on Mornings with Marie on Fox Business if he thought that this resistance was a smart strategy for Democrats. Now, remember, Mark Penn was Hillary Clinton's pollster in 2008. So we're talking from your side of the aisle. And he said, it's risky. If the economy shows growth in this uh, upcoming year, three to 4%, that a lot of those endangered Democrats in uh, competitive districts or competitive states, it's gonna be trouble for them. And you know, Chuck Schumer, he, he insisted on party unity, voting against this tax bill. There might be some Democrats who actually suffer. Well, and so I wanna get ahead to 2018 and one of the major issues, uh, Congress was given until March to basically address the DACA issue. Um, you know, so Richard, President Trump said that basically DACA is not going to happen unless he gets his border wall, unless uh, ch chain migration is ended, unless in, uh, the visa lottery is ended as well. So what are Democrats willing to give up to get DACA done I think next year? I think the deals have to be in the details. I think this president, as we know, blows a lot of hot air on Twitter. Um, and so we have to wait to see what actually the deals of the legislative bill looks like before we could say anything. Do you think but, they'd be on board with border security? I, I think border security is one thing. I think the wall is something else. I mean, here's the truth. The truth is this. Under President Obama's last year in office, there was more individuals deported than under President Trump's first year. Well, I don't agree with that, but those are the facts. The second thing is this, is that the, the chain migration has been a policy in this country for almost 60 years. It benefited people like Melania Trump. That's how she and her family got here. So to say that and to lump all immigrants in with the one or two individuals that are bad actors and say we need to throw the whole policy out is irresponsible. Do you think it's disingenuous to be for Democrats to be against a wall when you know they voted for a fence act back in 2006? You've got people like Senator Feinstein 
Chuck Schumer, who were then trumpeting border security, talking about how important it was, how much our country needs it. So, I mean, it's a little bit hypocritical uh, for them to be so against no, it No, 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 because I think what we understand is that the wall is it's a pointless ideal. Not only is it going to cost the American people billions and billions and billions of dollars that we can't afford because they've already given $1.5 trillion away in a tax cut, but beyond that fact, all that's going to happen are individuals that are intent on crossing the border. Number one, there are already tunnels that are used by MS-13 and other gangs, but number two, they're just going to, if you build a 14-foot wall, they're going to build a 15-foot fa- uh, foot ladder. So what we've really got to do is find a way not only to make sure that we, we deal with the 11 million people here living in the shadows and find a way to give, give them a pathway to citizenship, but beyond that, we've got to solve DACA, and we've also got to deal with the fact that we've got to, we've got to continue to, we are a, lo- we are a land of, lo- we are a land of, we are a country of law, but we're also a country of immigrants. Well, and let's get uh, Amy and Aaron on this as well, because Republicans aren't necessarily all on board with the border wall as well. So, I mean, mm-hmm. what do you foresee happening in the Republican Party? They've been divided themselves over issues on immigration. So, you know, what do you think we're going to see from the Republican front on DACA? Well, Republicans are united when it comes to border security, and Democrats used to be, and apparently they've become not engineers. Not actually the wall, though. Well, they've become yeah. engineers in deciding which elements of border security would work. If you if you talk to local officials, as, officials, as Fox did, I was watching it this afternoon, uh, the de- Attorney General of Texas said putting up a wall uh, between Mexico and El Paso made El Paso a much safer place. Republicans are not necessarily advocating putting up a concrete wall across all of those miles of border I mean, between California. Sort of uh, between, oh, hold on, Richard, finish. let me finish. Uh, but where I think you're going to see some compromise is on different methods of border security, not necessarily this wall idea. Uh, but where rubber really hits the road, Lisa, is DACA's deadline in March. I would say with January, you're going to see a lot of posturing. Democrats saying, we don't need to compromise on this because the DACA, what happens there, the real deadline is in March. And then uh, I think things get really heated up. And, you know, another issue that's been talked about is infrastructure. President Trump is hoping to work with Democrats on that issue. You know, Richard, does this get done? Do you think infrastructure or are Democrats on board with it? So, listen, one, this was the one thing I would give the president. When he when he won his, up, his presidency, while I didn't agree with him, I thought that infrastructure was something that's very positive. We know the, the engineer, I mean, tons and tons of engineers, the, the side of engineers have said that our infrastructure gets a D at best. If you go to airports in other parts of the country, in Switzerland, for example, they are 10 times nicer than LaGuardia. <laughs> I can agree with that. (laughs) Richard and I have both been in that airport. (laughs) What the president did wrong in his strategy coming into this, the beginning of his term, instead of trying to reaching out across the island, going for infrastructure first, he decided to go for a repeal and replace first. Now he's in a hard place in January and February and March because he has a Senate where he's one vote short thanks uh, to the Alabama race. Let me get Amy in here uh, real quick just for timing purposes because we're we're running out. Sure. Amy, what do you think? Does does infrastructure get done? I mean, Republicans are probably going to be a little split on how to address Mm -hmm. that as well over issues like funding. Funding. Uh, is it more federal? Is it more private? Right, exactly. Uh, so what do you think on infrastructure? Uh, you would think that it should be bipartisan, but you might see some opposition, as you say, on the Republican side. Because remember, Lisa, that when uh, President Obama was elected, he did that big stimulus bill, and which, of course, had uh, you know full Democratic support. And you know what President Obama said about that? One of the biggest lessons he learned as president is that there's no such thing as a shovel-ready job. So I think Don- uh, President Trump is going to have to navigate that within his own caucus of how best do we approach this that is the best use of taxpayer money. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your guys' time. This was a smart discussion, as I knew it would be when I knew you guys were coming on. Thank you. And Richard, uh, my friend, we will be... Starts at 8 o'clock, we, people. We, Tune in. It's going to be we, good. We are going to be freezing tomorrow. So have a great, guy, have a great night, guys. Thank and I'll you. see you uh, tomorrow, Richard. All right. Well, coming up, Ambassador John Bolton's here to weigh in on the risks of war with North Korea in 2018. Justice is back in just a moment, and you're not going to want to miss it. Trump with a strong warning this week for China to stop any illegal oil sales to North Korea. The president tweeted, caught red-handed, very disappointed that China is allowing oil to go into North Korea. There will never be a friendly solution to the North Korea problem if that continues to happen. And now reports that Russia is doing the exact same thing. Former ambassador uh, to the UN and Fox News contributor John Bolton joins me now with his reaction. Hi, Ambassador. Glad to be with you. Uh, you know, so Ambassador, last night on the story, uh, you reiterated something that CIA Director John, uh, Mike Pompeo said not too long ago, and the fact that North Korea is just a few months away from perfecting their nuclear weapons capabilities. Uh, So my question to you is, what do we do, what are options on the table that the United States has between now and then? 
Well, I think it's important to understand we're running out of time. Uh, there are a lot of ideas that are being thrown out that, you know, 20 years ago might have been effective ways to deal with the North Korean threat. We don't have the luxury of time anymore, and I think it's that constraint that we need to keep in mind, because if you misestimate uh, when North Korea does have the capability to drop thermonuclear weapons on American cities, at that point it's too late because of the risk of but nuclear what tools retaliation. Do we have? at our disposal. What, but what tools do we have at our disposal? Because well, I, I know that you've, you've been critical of sanctions in the past, or at least saying that they're just not going to be effective, particularly given the time frame uh, that we have. And as President Trump had tweeted, China's cheating, Russia's cheating. They're not following through on the sanctions. So what do we do? What tools do we have uh, to try to really put the screws to them uh, in that really short period of time? Yeah, well, I think we've misapplied sanctions for a number of years. That's a different story. I think there's one diplomatic play left, uh, and despite what we've seen by China's performance, I do think there's an argument uh, to their national interest that reuniting the Korean Peninsula actually should work for them. I wish we'd started on that one a while ago, but people want to exhaust every potential diplomatic option. I think that's one we need to pursue. Uh, otherwise, we're getting down to very unattractive uh, options for the president. This is a legacy of 25 years of not stopping North Korea. Uh, but the options, I think, are going to come down to two very quickly. One is you let North Korea have deliverable nuclear weapons with all that that entails, or you look at the use of preemptive military force. Nobody likes either one of those options. But if those are the two that are there to choose, you're going to have to pick one. Well, on the preemptive force, so the Pentagon had said not too long ago that basically the only way to fully and confidently get rid of the weapons that they have uh, is ground invasion. I, I mean, so what options militarily do we have and, and what would you suggest or, or where do you think we go if that's the only option that we have left? Well, I don't, I don't think that's the Pentagon view. I think there are a whole well, range there, there of things we could to, do. There was a letter to Congress, or there was a letter to lawmakers from Pentagon saying, or from the Pentagon, uh, basically saying that that was the only way that they would be fully confident uh, yeah, to sure. get if rid of. Yeah, sure. We took over North Korea. If we completely occupied it, we would be fully confident. The right. issue is, uh, is there a way to go after the facilities that we know about? Uh, and destroy them. And I think the answer to that's very clear. I think that is entirely doable. The problem is that any use of force against North Korea, a targeted assassination of Kim Jong-un, the use of special operators, cyber warfare uh, even, could trigger a North Korean retaliation against South Korea. That's what people are most worried about, and legitimately so. So I think whatever option that we picked, we'd have to do whatever we could to minimize the potential for North Korean retaliation. And there have been analyses and contingency plans drawn for that. Nobody wants this conflict, but I think you have to look at it uh, in a very cold and objective way, because the threat to the American people of uh, North Korea not only having this capability itself, but selling it to others, selling it to Iran, selling it to terrorist groups, selling it to other aspiring nuclear weapon states, means that we are at the point today, if we don't stop North Korea, we will have lost 50 years of international mm -hmm. effort to counter the proliferation of nuclear weapons. That's what's at stake here. No, it's very scary. And, and Ambassador, looking ahead to 2018, you know, what are the biggest national security challenges uh, to this administration? I know there are many. Uh, but what would you say you know, are the top three that, that are facing this administration and the country? Well, I think the proliferation of nuclear weapons, which we've just talked about in the context of Korea, is obviously number one. I'd put it in the context of Iran, too. I don't think the Iranians have given up their pursuit of that objective, and they could well be doing it with the North Koreans. It's one reason uh, this is so dangerous. I think the spread of uh, international terrorism continues apace. We've seen uh, attacks as recently as this past few days in Egypt and Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, so even the defeat of the ISIS caliphate doesn't mean that threat is over. I think it's going to continue throughout the new year. And then I think the slightly longer range threats of uh, China and Russia remain. We need strategies to deal with them. I think the administration has begun that, but the threat remains acute. So I think 2018 on the national security front is going to be a very busy year for the administration. A lot going on, and we appreciate your expertise and bringing that to us tonight. So thank you for joining us, and thank Happy you. New Year. Happy New Year. Hi, from America's News Headquarters, I'm Alicia Cunha.
The Russian Supreme Court rejected the appeal of opposition leader Alexei Navalny, upholding the Central Election Commission decision to declare him ineligible to run against Vladimir Putin in the country's 2018 presidential election. Navalny was barred from running due to criminal charges that he says were fraudulent and politically motivated. Navalny says he will not recognize elections without competition and has called for a boycott. The deep south facing a deep freeze, potentially deadly cold temperatures in store for the region. Frigid conditions are expected to last several days. Weather advisories cover most of Mississippi, Alabama, and parts of Louisiana. In Atlanta, advocates are worried the weather could kill homeless people unprepared for the cold. I'm Alicia Cunha. Now back to Justice with Judge Janine. Hi, and welcome back to Justice. Let's take a look ahead and have a little bit of fun predicting what we think 2018 will bring. My power panel is here to break it all down. Turning Point USA founder Charlie Kirk and Democratic strategist Danielle McLaughlin, who are here with me now. Hey, guys. All right, well, let's have a little bit of fun with this because it's almost the new year and fun is needed sometimes. Uh, you know, Charlie, so hit me. 2018 predictions, what are your top three? What are we going to see? Sure. So I think the GOP is going to win uh, big league in uh, 2018 <laughs> in November. I think they're going to do very, very well, uh, better than what people, uh, some people might believe. I think we're going to hit 5% economic growth because of this amazing tax cut that was just passed. I think it's going to far surpass estimates. And finally, I think that the Russia investigation will exonerate President Trump and actually backfire against its original intent to try to politically harm the president. I think it's actually going to give a clean bill of health and show that there is no collusion uh, in the 2016 presidential elections. Those are my big three predictions heading into 2018. Charlie, those are some pretty big predictions. So, Danielle, what do you think about that? So, uh, Charlie said big wins in 2018 yeah. for Republicans. Uh, Mueller's going to exonerate, exonerate President Trump. Uh, and we're going to hit 5% economic growth. Your thoughts? You know, I'm not going to actually quibble with 5% economic growth. I think that would be amazing. Um, I think that we're going to see a blue wave in 2018 just based on the, what we're seeing with the kind of the Democrats are 13, up 13 points uh, in the generic ballot. For, so I'm going to disagree with Charlie on that. My big concern with 2018 is the royal wedding and whether both Obama and Trump will be uh, invited, just to put a little bit of a light spin <laughs> on all of this. And the last thing I'll say is women, 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 women. From the Women's March, we're going to see women in 2018 running from everything from dog catcher to and I think that's a fantastic thing. Do you think Dems are overplaying their hand a little bit on uh, tax or opposing tax reform? Uh, also, we've seen the economy uh, been growing at a pretty steady pace here. Uh, we've already seen companies dole out bonuses, uh, you know, plan for investments as well. So do you think Democrats are maybe overplaying their hand a little bit there, Daniel? It's possible. Um, we will see. Like I said, up 13 in the, in, the, in the ballot right now, that's really good. If this happened in 2008, 2010, and we saw big swings, both Republicans and Democrats. So I, I think it could happen, but that might change. We're a long way from the midterms as much as other pundits might tell you that it's uh, around the corner. Well, I know as much because I have worked in politics for a long time. So it's a, we feel like it's a, a year away it will be, or, you know, it feels like five years. Um, all right, so Danielle, what are your three biggest predictions 2018? So 2018, I'm just going to tell you, the women were taken away. We're taking away in, in all of these races. Um, I'm interested to see what's going to happen with the Mueller investigation. I'm not sure it's going to be exoneration. I think we could go for years. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. As long as they get to the bottom of it, it's cool. It's fine with me. Whatever happens, happens. You know, we just want to get to the truth. Well, what was your third? You said Oh, yeah, women, women, Mueller. And then I said the royal wedding. Will Obama and Trump be both coming? This is a huge political scandal in the making. I'm hoping that they both go and we can all just be friends for, Charlie, for, for the sake think, of the royals. Do you think well. the president wants to attend the wedding? No, I, I don't. I don't think that's going to be a top top priority. But I, <laughs> I, I will comment back priority. on. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I will comment back on what what you were mentioning with uh, this supposed democratic wave that's building in 2018. Be very, very careful. Uh, I think with saying that, I mean the map is heavily favored Republicans. You look at states like North Dakota, Montana, Missouri, Indiana, West Virginia. Those are all incumbent Democrat senators, and those states still have high favorability ratings for Republicans and for President Trump. And again, the economy is booming. It's it's just indisputable, and you're seeing companies dish out hundreds of millions of dollars in bonuses and trillions of dollars of capital going to start to come back to this country. And so uh, there's going to be a lot of headwinds and the Democrats are going to be on the wrong side of tax reform and tax cuts, which they already proved they were back here in December. And I want to get your guys' prediction on another issue. We talked a little bit earlier on the show about immigration 
and DACA and the deadline that President Trump gave Congress uh, to march to figure it out. So, Charlie, I'll start with you. You know, do you think something is going to get done on DACA? And President Trump said he wants the wall. Uh, he wants to get rid of chain migration. He wants to get rid of the diversity lottery. Uh, so what do you think? Is he going to get those objectives? Is he going to get those priorities done? So I, my prediction will be that the president stands firm and the president's going to do what he said he's going to do. The problem, I think, is you're going to see defecting Republican senators that are going to do some sort of bait and switch deal to try to get a back end, you know, um, deal to not have DACA, uh, to have DACA either continued or to have the wall not funded. The president, I think, is going to stand firm. But look, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made here. And until we have strict border security, immigration is only going to be a perpetual issue in this country that we're going to be talking about every 10 years because we've never actually fixed the issue itself. You know, Danielle, what's wrong? with border security why do so dem so many Democrats they you know they seem to oppose it you know and, and I think Democrats are really gonna have a split as well in their party I mean we've seen immigration activists uh, we even saw Nancy Pelosi sort of get an uh, earful from immigration activists so I think Democrats are gonna have to a hard time too on DACA and any concessions they make are gonna be perceived negatively uh, from those activists and from that part of their base so you know what do you think uh, what do you think is gonna happen with DACA and Democrats will they concede on border security or not I think they're going to have to try and thread the needle. I think that the wall is a symbolic piece of resistance against the Trump agenda in some ways. And I think it is seen in a very negative light by many Democrats. So I think what the Democrats probably should do is be, a, be willing to spend money on security. So additional personnel. What about the wall? I think the wall is going to be a sticking point. I just don't see Democrats coming on board. And I, 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 I fear for well, the they recipients. Personally, no. I think that from an environmental perspective, from a property rights perspective, you just said it was symbolic. The wall is a bad idea. A bad. Well, you, you know, just politics, said it was Charlie, symbolic. Symbols matter in politics, as you well know. Well, but for the, the uh, fundamental policies behind it, I think, are also problematic. All right. So we're yeah, running well, out. Well, wall, walls work. So we're, we're running out of time here. So real quick, I just want to get you guys on infrastructure. Charlie, does infrastructure bill get done? Uh, I hope so. And look, the this is something the Democrats have to get on board for. And look, the president has some very bold ideas that he's going to start uh, rolling out. You know, some of the whispers in the wind are that he's going to try to have a big 5G national Wi-Fi plan. You know, some of this stuff's going to be really hard for Democrats to oppose. This is stuff right. that they've been advocating for themselves. Well, the question is, how do you pay for it? That's going to be the question. Well, and that's a good question. That is going to be an issue for Republicans and for Democrats. Uh, Danielle, real quick, we're running out of time. Uh, does, does infrastructure get done? I hope it does, and I actually agree with Charlie that the devil will be in the details, and that mm -hmm. means payment, how this gets paid for. Good point. All right, well, we're going to see. They made their predictions, so we'll have to, you know, well, I, I can't speak for Judge Janine, so I, I can't invite you guys back on the show, actually. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Maybe you'll come back. Maybe you won't. No, I'm just kidding. You'll, you'll probably come back. But anyways, thanks for your time, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thanks, guys. All right, well, religious liberty in America, another critically important topic in 2017, and I'm sure it will continue to be in 2018 as well. So let's take a look back at Judge Janine's exclusive interview with Hobby Lobby CEO and Chairman of the Board for the Museum of the Bible, Steve Green. Take a listen. Now, you were one of the world's largest retailers, privately owned retailers, and one of the most successful businessmen in the country. And yet you've undertaken this mammoth project, 430,000 square feet, the Museum of the Bible here in Washington, D.C. There is nothing like it anywhere in the world. Why? I grew up in a home that had a love for God's Word. Um, I grew up in a Christian home. My parents took us to church and uh, raised our family according to the Bible. And in our business, uh, if you look at the first statement of purpose in our business, it says to operate our business according to biblical principles. And it has served us well. And I am blessed to be born in a country that our founders built from principles they found in this book. So I have been blessed personally by this book in multiple ways and we just want to encourage others to in consider this book themselves. Uh, we want to inspire them to engage with it and consider the principles this book teaches for their own life. You know, they say that 90% of American homes have within them a, a Bible. And yet it seems that j this generation, unlike previous generations, has never been more distanced from the Bible. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I think you could argue we're probably more ignorant of this book than we have ever been as a nation. And I believe primarily because we don't teach it in our schools as we once did. It was regularly taught in our schools, so people grew up knowing it. Uh, our founders, it was common. They would uh, speak from the Bible, and they wouldn't have to give chapter and verse because everybody knew what they were talking about. Today, 
you make a quote from the Bible and many have no idea what you're talking about or where the source is. Even common phrases within our vernacular come from the Bible that uh, many people would have no idea that that's where it comes from. In this museum, you have created technology to tell this story. Technology, I understand, that didn't exist. You created it and patented it. Tell us about that. There, there is new technology. One uh, specific example is there is a digital docent. It's uh, a tablet, uh, smaller than maybe an iPad, a little larger than an iPhone, where a, a visitor can uh, customize it, tell it how long they want to be in the museum, what their interest uh, is, and then it will direct them through the museum using in indoor guidance that knows where they're at within inches. This is some of the new technology that we have patented. Bronze doors downstairs, powerful, impactful, but more than that, how much do they weigh? 16 tons collectively. They're, you don't want them falling over on you. That's for sure. how, how do you deliver 16 tons of doors? One piece at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Museum of the Bible, the Capitol, Supreme Court, Library of Congress. It's amazing how much of our American history reflects quotes from the Bible. So this is the Museum of the Bible here, and you show we can show you how far. We're just a few blocks from the United States Capitol. And so what is written in the United States Capitol well, is quoted a lot from of the things. Bible. What we do is some of the paintings right there in the rotunda, uh, yeah. the Mayflowers are coming over. There is a Bible that they're showing, a Geneva Bible that's uh, in the painting that we'll show. This is where we have scripture around us all day long. In many cases, we don't even know it. It's just phrases from our language that are, that are used. Here you have Victoria Beckham with a tattoo that literally quotes the Song of Solomon. You know, that, that the Bible is so relevant to so many people in so many ways that we don't even recognize. One of the things that uh, you have done that also speaks to how religion plays such an important part of your life is as that uh, not-for-profit business owner of Hobby Lobby, you took the Obama administration uh, to the United States Supreme Court. You fought for religious freedom. You funded the case. Where the Obama administration uh, uh, made a mandate that religion uh, be damned and you would have to pay uh, for abortifacts for any employee in your employ. And you felt that that was a violation of your religious freedom. Number one, why, how hard was it, and what did it feel like when you won? If life begins at conception, as our family believes, then to take part of uh, an abortive drug or process, we view that as taking life. And that is something that violates our religious beliefs. And there are many in this country, there are many that believe the same that way that we do. That taking life is obviously in our mind wrong. And so for the government to come in and tell us that we had to freely provide to our employees products that could take life, that violated our conscience and we felt like we had no option but to take the, the, and challenge the government on the mandate that they required us to take part of that. And so uh, we met as a family and uh, the, the decision was unanimous that we really felt like we had no option but to challenge the government that we love uh, on the mandate that they had uh, put on our, our business. And when you won? We won, it was, a, it was an exciting day. I think that there was, uh, for many of us, we somewhat felt like we would have a win, but there's no guarantee. We just, there was a, there was a certain comfort that we had that we knew we were doing the right thing. And uh, we were uh, at Oxford, uh, my wife and I, the rest of the family was at the corporate office at our uh, offices in Oklahoma City, and uh, we were Skyping in, and it was just a, a, a thrilling day to know that uh, the foundational principle that this nation was built upon, our religious freedoms, were upheld and uh, just the pride of our country uh, is, I remember uh, some of the feelings that I had. This section is called Bible Now, showing how people are engaging with it right now. Another world map showing people that are opening up the app to engage with the Bible. So the skeptic comes in here thinking that nobody's reading this book anymore. No, there are people all over the world right now engaging. <laughs> President Trump's battle with the media dominating much of 2017 and will surely continue to make headlines in the new year. The president tweeting a short time ago, I use social media not because I like to, 
but because it is the only way to fight a very dishonest and unfair press. Now often referred to as fake news media, phony and non-existent sources are being used more often than ever. Many stories and reporters are pure fiction. Joining me now with his reaction to all of this and more is political consultant and member of the advisory board for Trump 2020, Harlan Hill. Hey, Harlan. It's great to be with you. It's great to be with you too, my friend. All right, so I want to get your reaction. Obviously, sure. huge story throughout 2017. The media did not like a lot of the things that the president <laughs> did. President Trump did not like a lot of the things that the media yep. did. So there was a lot of back and forth. Um, but I want to talk to you specifically about that statement that I read and that tweet that he read and saying that, you know, he doesn't use social media um, because he likes to. It's because he has to. Yes. What are your thoughts on that? Well, and that's backed up by the facts. Look, I'm, I'm really data driven. And when you look at how the media has covered him over the last year, just 5 percent of their coverage has been positive. Comparing that to Obama, Right in his first year, their coverage was glowing. On the cover of Newsweek magazine, they literally put a halo behind Obama's hair to, uh, head to make him look like he was Jesus. Right, and meanwhile, you have magazines holding up a you know a, a, a severed head of the president of the United States, President Trump. You have comedians doing the same thing in Hollywood. The coverage that he has gotten, the 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 lack of respect that they have for the office and the president of the United States is uncharted. What do you think, in in your assessment, what are some of the more glaring examples that you've seen mm -hmm. throughout 2017? Well, actually, I find the most offensive example is the fact that they don't cover any of the positive things that he's done. I mean, you look at the stock market, for instance. We've hit over 70 highs on, on, on the NASDAQ New York Stock Exchange uh, over the last year. The economy is roaring. We have 3% growth for two quarters in a row. We haven't had this in a long time. We had this historic tax bill. The most egregious example is the fact that they're not looking at the positives that are happening. And it's not about the president. And the president makes this clear. The, 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 the news here isn't that he's having success. It's that the American people finally have relief after eight years of economic stagnation. And the media is not covering it. That's the story of 2018. And we're not hearing it. If you watch CBS or NBC or ABC, you don't even know that this is happening. Do you worry if voters aren't hearing it that that's going to have a negative impact for Republicans in, in 2018 or 2020? Well, I mean, ultimately, they look at their paycheck and it's going to be getting bigger in 2018. Right. I mean, you have pay increases across the board, take home pay is going up. More money in your pocket should translate to votes. But we know that the mainstream media, they are diametrically opposed to this president. And they're going to come up with every excuse to make it seem as though the president isn't the reason for it. And they've already started doing that. That's how I know that this is going to happen. They say, oh, this, the economy's cyclical. The stock market's cyclical. You know, Obama set up all of this. He, you know, he deserves credit for this. But, you know, you know, we have common sense and we look at the last eight years where things just didn't feel like anything was getting done. And uh, and it, the, the contrast is extremely stark. And the American people are smart enough to know um, why this is happening. What do, you, do you think that the negative media attention that President Trump gets, because we had showed earlier on the screen for the viewers at home, uh, you know, the Pew Research Center, because mm -hmm. you had mentioned it yes. in, in what you're, you're talking about. Sure. Uh, and, the, and the fact is that we've seen President Trump has gotten three times more negative coverage. I think it was in his first 60 days of office, according to Pew Research. So does this have a galvanizing effect for those who support the president because do they view this um, as you know the president is under attack as you yeah. had mentioned that he's yeah. not he's being treated unfairly that you know there's a lot of positive things going on in their life in terms of the economy but they're not seeing that yeah. on their television screens they're not seeing that when they're reading it either so you know in yeah. your estimation does this have a galvanizing galvanizing uh, effect Absolutely. well republican confidence in the media republicans belief in the media is down to 14 percent only 14% of Republican voters in this country believe that the media is giving anybody a fair shake or, or, or reporting real news. So this didn't happen overnight. This isn't just about President Trump. The reason President Trump was elected was because Republicans were fed up and they finally took a stand against the mainstream media's rhetoric. They finally took a, a stand against the talking points that have come down from on high from the DNC, as we saw with the email leaks, literally going to, 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 to writers at the New York Times, telling them how to carry out a story. So, and so they, they're finally taking a stand real, and they're saying enough's enough. All right. Real quick. Yes or no. Does he ever take it too far? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> all right, we'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. I love I'm you, not gonna... President. I love you. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Harlan, thank you. I thought yes or no would maybe. <laughs> all right, thank you. Happy New Year. Coming up, you've been waiting for it all night. The best of Judge Janine's street justice is next. Well, it's been a great year, but uh, unfortunately, we have to say goodbye to 2017. So let's take a look back at the best of Judge Janine's street justice and some of her favorite moments. Take a look. How do you have so much faith in Donald Trump? Why? Because, why? Because you just think he's a real person and he wants to get real, make real differences in people's lives. I feel like the world is going to be righted the right way. Yes. And we're kicking this guy on his airplane back to wherever he belongs. And you know, you know what? What? He's going to have to wash his own damn dishes tonight. Oh! Why are they protesting? I think they're bored. They're not working. <laughs> a couple of years ago, I went back home and I had a long beard and I was stopped at the airport. Well, not really stopped. All right, you were stopped. Question. You were yeah, questioned. Right. Did they let you through? Yeah, they did. Okay, they did. let's get over it. What now? Are these mainstream media people out of their minds? They are. Why? Forget about it. I can't forget about it. We got to do a second. Should Hillary come back and run for mayor? No! Everybody should be in Obamacare and let me know how they live their lives. How about that? You know, Paul Ryan, <laughs> this is what makes me furious. The media is all focused on Russia and investigations. What would you like the president to be doing now? Building the wall. What do you want the president to do for you? Stop tweeting. So me and Matilda are here on the uh, on the border in Cochise County in Arizona. Matilda and I are going to go for a little walk and find out how protected we are. As you can see, we're coming to the end of the 20-foot fence and going further, there is virtually no fence. There's virtually no fence. As you can see, it's dark. We're on a dusty road. We're going right to the border uh, and to see what activity is going on there. What you're seeing right now is me 100 yards from the border through the technology, through the night vision that Border Patrol has. Their technology is even more advanced. We can't talk about that. But as they police and patrol the area, they can see shadows. They can see individuals coming along the border, irrespective of how black it is, how dark it is. Here we are securing the border. Fox News at work. Have you heard about the rats in the White House? I have not. How do we find out who's doing the leak? I guess you get someone to leak that to you. Ah, very good. Are you worried about nuclear war? No. Not Why not? Uh, I don't know. I'm worried about these dogs at the moment. You worried about nuclear war? Are you? Were you worried about nuclear war? What should we do to Kim Jong Un from North Korea? What should we do to him? Strap him to the rocket. How tall are you? Six foot nine. Six nine? Yeah. You play basketball? Used to. Yeah. Why'd you give it up? I got old. Why are the football players protesting? Uh, they're not really protesting. What are they doing? I don't think they know. Because they want to stand for something, and they're fed up of the discrimination. They're not standing. They're taking a knee. They're commies. They're what? Commies. Is this the real Melania Trump? Stop kissing me. <laughs> oh, gosh, not him. So you don't think he's the sexiest man alive? I'm sorry, no. Who is the sexiest man alive? That guy? <laughs> right? Is that the good answer? We love you. Yeah, I love you. You're amazing. <laughs> oh, I like Thank him, you. too. <laughs> Here's the judge. The judge, jury, and executioner. Yeah, that's me, baby. Okay, Lindsey Vaughn, the Olympic gold medalist, a skier, says that she'll represent the United States in the Olympics, but she won't represent Donald Trump. What do you think of that? I think Donald Trump's our president, then whether you like him or not, you got to respect the fact he's our president. If nobody likes Trump anymore. I don't know. How about you? Except me and you. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Get up. Get on up. Get into it. Okay, let me ask you this. Everybody involved. James Round, hang on, Lucy. Is there a reason Hillary Clinton keeps blaming people? Did she, Lucy, did she blame you? Did Hillary blame you? I love you. Bye. I see you did. Bye. <laughs> Bye. I knew that I would. <laughs> we'll be right back. Fox News Channel.